Okay, welcome, welcome. My name is Joy Brown. I'm a youth leadership and engagement worker at North York Community House and the co-facilitator of this amazing program along with our amazing youth and residents. We're so happy to have you here. I see a bunch of people introducing themselves in the chat. Thank you so much for being here and taking your time. We know this is a huge time investment, but we want to provide this opportunity for you to learn about our program and also to connect to all the amazing things happening around our city. So, I think without further ado, we're ready to actually start. Uh, so we're going to actually open up the conference with our one of our amazing youth, Shobiga. Thank you, Joy. Good afternoon and welcome to our Youth Architects Conference. My name is Shobiga and I'm a student of the 2020 Youth Architects Program. The Youth Architects Program has engaged many students, including me, on getting a glimpse and idea of architecture by designing our own unique pavilion using various media such as Tinkercad. It was such an amazing experience. Now, for today, our agenda includes our Youth Architects Program, a Green Change presentation, a Lawrence Heights Art Center presentation, and we will be ending off today with a roundtable discussion. Thank you again for coming. We really appreciate it. We hope you enjoy this conference and learn something new. Today, we continue to shine a light on community partners with the hopes of building bridges and the vision of building sustainable communities. Thank you. Thank you, Shobiga. Uh, we're going to move into our land acknowledgement. For those of you who were here yesterday, it's, it's a bit of a repeat in the first beginning before we start our presentations. Uh, but uh, this land acknowledgement is very much, uh, it's for North York Community House. So we know it doesn't represent all of Toronto or even Turtle Island as a whole, North America. Uh, so we just want to honor all First Nations, indig Indigenous folks, peoples around the world, North America and Turtle Island. Uh, and we're going to begin with our land acknowledgement. Thank you so much. We acknowledge the land in which we gather is a traditional territory of many First Nations, including Wendat, Ojibwe, Huron, Haudenosaunee, Chippewa, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. We at North York Community House honor the territory's indigenous history and move forward in the spirit of reconciliation and to the enduring presence of First Nation, the Métis Nation, and the Inuit peoples. And now we're going to do a bit of a brief recap. Once again, if you were here yesterday with us, it's a bit of a review of last of yesterday. Uh, but uh, I think we think it's very important to provide everyone with some context about our program before we dive into all these great things. So uh, as we mentioned, you know, our program has engaged 15 youth and residents over the period of six weeks on Zoom, y'all. Zoom. <laughs> doing this amazing program, you know, building understanding and um, connection and empathy around the Lawrence Heights uh, community revitalization. Uh, we wanted to look at residents as experts of their own experience, of their own lived experience. We wanted to uh, see the value residents in the design process, reimagine the community through a strengths-based approach, uh, allowing imagination to be fueled by the hopes and dreams of residents. And yesterday, uh, the youth uh, and the residents got a chance to um, actually present their ideas. So we do want to do a bit of a recap and I, uh, of yesterday uh, of their actual um, designs. So I might be putting some people on the spot. So students, assistants, uh, if you're in the meeting today at this conference and you have anything you want to add about your design, please unmute and share a little bit about your design. So we're starting with the New Heights Creative Arts Center. So if anyone from the New Heights Arts, Arts Creative Arts Center is here and you would like to share uh, one or two things about your design, uh, please unmute and share with the team uh, your, about your design. Okay, I don't think anyone wants to share it, but basically it's a pavilion um, and it's a creative uh, pavilion. And um, this is one of the team's uh, designs. We will be sharing their uh, presentations to everyone that wasn't actually at the presentation yesterday. Uh, but if you do want to share in the chat about your pavilion, so the people that weren't there yesterday can learn about uh, your design, please do, uh, but no pressure. Um, so let's move on to the next one. 
And the next uh, crystal uh, pavilion was a second team and they had this design for the pavilions. Uh, and each pavilion was actually designed with residents uh, involved in the co-design process. And um, as, you can, as you can probably see with the crystal pavilion, there's three or four rooms involved. So each room was gonna be for a particular set of residents or resident groups. Uh, so this is kind of a recap of their images. This is a no means a recap of their presentations, uh, but just so you can see some of the artistic visions of our residents and our youth. We once again wanna thank uh, and congratulate all of our youth architects um, and rename them again, Octavia, Talia, John, Diana, Jacob, Ace, Maury, Mohammed, Havish, Shobika, Athavan, and Diana Lynn. Uh, without these uh, young people, it wouldn't be possible. They did an amazing job yesterday and they're gonna do amazing jobs in their lives moving forward. And we're just so grateful for their expertise and their leadership and all the great things that they do. So without further ado, let's actually begin with our first presentation uh, from the Jane Finch Community and Family Center. Uh, so I just wanna get a sense if they're ready to go. Uh, but yes, we're gonna start first with that. And they're gonna be talking about their project build. Hi everyone, um, my name is Ernestine and I'm the Community Design Coordinator at Green Change, which is part of uh, the Jane Finch Center. Uh, and I'm here with TJ today, um, who also helped to run the Project Build program this year. Um, and we'll be just sharing a little bit more about the program um, and kind of our key learnings from it. Thank you. You can actually share your presentation or maybe we can oh. stop sharing so you can share yours. Sure. I can do that. Oops. Oh, okay. Cool. Let me just share. Let me know if you're able to see this. Is it? Showing up? Yep. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, so we'll just give a little brief overview of it. So Project Build is a very similar program to the Young Architects program in that it is a youth focused program all about design. Um, so I'm just going to share a little bit of information about who we are at the Jane Finch Center and at Green Change. Um, so the Jane Finch Center is a community-based multi-service agency focusing on reducing poverty through res resident engagement, capacity building, and advocacy. Um, and we have a wide range of programs that go from financial literacy to early on programs, youth programs, uh, community development, and urban planning and design, which is where Green Change fits in. Um, so Green Change is the planning and design team that works directly with local residents to improve their physical environment and create more equitable neighborhoods. Um, and we have a wide range of uh, projects as well. And Project Build is one of them. I'm also going to be touching on another project that we're working on called Corner Commons, which is uh, related back to the Project Build program. Um, so just to provide a little bit of an overview of the program as a whole, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's a design build program based in Jane Finch and it's open to youth ages 13 to 18 years old. Um, it runs weekly uh, from this year, we did it from October all the way to June and this was actually our pilot year and it was funded by the WC Kitchen Foundation. Um, this program is actually a little bit of an extension from our successful Fields to Parks program, uh, which works with elementary school students to reimagine and transform some of their neglected uh, public green spaces. Uh, so they're able to come up with an idea for it, create little mock-ups, and then also present it to the community. Um, so Project Bills is an extension of that because we want to focus on a little bit of an older uh, group of youth who can physically build without their ideas. Um, um, and we also want to offer this program after doing research or uh, outreach and hearing from uh, people in the, the program is that there is a lack of after school programs focused on design, um, a field that lacks quite a bit of diversity. And uh, we want to provide a, a space where people can kind of explore these interests in design as well as develop skills and learn new tools that can um, take them on to post-secondary education or um, also 
just in the in the design careers. So I'm gonna let TJ talk a little bit about our outreach um, and a little bit about the workshops that we did through these outreach. So yeah. hi guys, my name is TJ. Um, it was actually my first year working with Green Change. I'm actually just a student. Um, I'm in Teachers College at York University. So I got placed there um, for my community placement. And I was working with Ernestine and Clara for um, Build. And um, right now I'm, I'm a teacher candidate hoping to teach high school. So when we did outreach at a couple of high schools, it was really interesting to see um, how many of them were kind of shy to even come up to our table. I mean, I, I get it though, because it's like, who are these people? Why are they at a school? Uh, but when, when people did come, it was, I feel like some of them were actually genuinely interested in seeing uh, a program kind of like what Ernestine said, where it's like, um, it's an architecture, a design, you're, you're working with computers, you're working with technology. It's something that you don't always see offered, especially in a community, um, maybe like Jane and Finch or other communities where they're, maybe they're just pushing other agendas. So it's cool. It was cool to see some students come up and, and pick up our flyers and um, basically show that they were interested. Um, and we had a couple people sign up, which was really good. Uh, some of them who didn't have any previous experience at all using stuff like Photoshop or SketchUp. Um, so it was, it, it was really nice, I feel like, for them to have the opportunity to work with those programs. Um, and Ernestine actually did a couple workshops in those schools, I think it was at, um, what was the high school that you? At C.W. Jeffries. C.W. Jeffries, yeah. Um, so we were able to host um, a few uh, SketchUp workshops within mm -hmm. some of the classes. Um, I believe there are grade 10 and grade 11 classes, uh, just to give them some insights on what SketchUp actually was, and also provide a little bit of a preview of what to expect from the after school program. And we found that we got a lot of people signing up after doing that. Uh, many of them had maybe never used SketchUp before or, or had always been interested in it, but maybe a little intimidated to use it. Yeah. And a lot of them really just enjoyed kind of playing around on it. Uh, what we did with those workshops was created models with Lego and they were tasked with building it on the um, computer um, and many people just really enjoyed doing that. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's also, um, especially because it was during class time, so it's like, okay, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> why not? <laughs> yeah. That was cool. Um, and I'll let TJ also talk a little bit about the process. As I mentioned earlier, um, the program ran from October 2019 to June 2020, and we broke it up into three phases that uh, TJ will just tell you a little bit about. Yes. Yeah. So um, for the students that signed up, we met every week, uh, every Wednesday, we would meet up. And for the first uh, half, or the I guess the first third of it or so, was the research phase. So we, uh, we basically asked them, since they're from the community itself, what type of things they thought could be improved in their community. We're talking about like uh, public spaces, uh, anything that um, their age group or the community itself uses. And we conducted research on basically mapping out what, uh, what might bring the community closer together, what might interest the community. Um, and we, we, we also did a site visit where we actually went to, so with Project Build, uh, we actually had uh, one of the parking, sp or um, it's like a, how, how big is the space? Um, it's a sizable corner of the uh, local mall's parking lot. At, at uh, Jane and Finch, Jane Finch Mall. Yeah. yeah. So basically what we did a site visit and we would, uh, we took the kids, we gave them photos, or sorry, cameras, and we let them take photos of the place to kind of see uh, maybe like a before and after. And we also did, we, we asked some of the, people just walking around um, if they would be interested in seeing something built there by the community for the community um, and if they were what what would they want to see uh, so I think the research phase was really interesting because a lot of the students um, didn't know that so much planning went into things like design and building and, and architecture and it really got them involved in that type of phase um, which we like now that we're looking back at it might have been a little bit longer because once we moved on to the design phase we noticed that um, we needed to spend much more time doing that where they whereas they needed much more time um, working with the programs learning how they work 
um, and tweaking uh, the designs and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. And um, sorry, and then we, sorry, and then the build phase was the last phase, uh, which um, because of COVID, we didn't actually get to, which was a sad part. We did end up finishing our design. Uh, we also had a couple mentors from Jane and Finch community that came and helped us. Uh, Sala Robinson came. Um, he came and kind of just uh, spewed ideas so that the students could kind of feed off of, uh, trying to see what might be helpful uh, for the community. But because of COVID, we didn't get to actually build what we um, prototyped, which was sad. Um, yeah, and as uh, TJ had mentioned, um, we had that parking lot site uh, at the Jane Finch Mall, which was a part of another project that um, Green Change is working on called Quarter Commons. And we've been working on it for the past year or so, um, and the youth participants in Project Build program uh, were tasked to design and build a future to be placed into Quarter Commons. Uh, Quarter Commons, we hosted a pop-up of it uh, last year. Essentially, it just looks to animate the Jane Finch Mall parking lot into an inviting public space for the community to use, and we'd have different furniture design features that would make it accessible and comfortable, as well as host a variety of different activities on site. Um, that site has a long standing history in the community of being a space where um, community comes together, uh, different events happen, rallies happen there. Um, there's like an annual back to school event that happens there, but it is just like an open parking lot. Um, so we wanted to, with Corner Commons, to, uh, to make it um, to honor those uses and also accommodate more of those activities that happen there. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the design that our participants came up with. They came up with a photo booth design um, and as TJ had also mentioned, we had mentors from the community come in to speak on different topics. So topics that our participants were interested in. Uh, we had one participant who was really interested in animation, um, so we brought in uh, local artist Sala Robinson to speak a little bit about um, his career path in animation as well as run brainstorming sessions to create different ideas for uh, what can go into Corner Commons and one of them was a, uh, a photo booth. Um, one of our other um, guest speakers was um, Shannon Holness, who's a local urban planner, who taught us a little bit about kind of the work that goes into urban planning and design. Um, but yeah, I may let TJ talk a little bit about the, the photo booth design. Right. So uh, we were kind of thinking of something that uh, people could visit um, readily and maybe take pictures of. So kind of like the Toronto sign downtown. Um, and I know there's some, even in my, in Scarborough, there's like a couple places where people just hang out, take pictures, um, and chill that. So we're thinking uh, ma of making this photo booth. So it was just gonna be um, constructed like in the right picture. And then we did prototypes uh, at the bottom over there. Uh, and it would have different backgrounds so that basically a, a lot of people could use it at the same time. And it would also um, entertain different age groups and so forth. So that's one thing that we, uh, really spend time on what are the backgrounds going to be um, so that other people will always be interested in. So we want, we thought of a couple of things. One of the students, uh, Dimitri, he was really into like gaming and um, stuff like that. So he's pushing for something in that area. Um, we were, and then we, we got him to think of um, those, uh, what are those, those things called where it's like a, oh, optical illusion. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, the optical illusion background, which is really cool. Like it's kind of like where you look small on the other side, but you look really big on the other side. Uh, we also thought of uh, like some type of background to do with nature or something that kids will love. And then um, something sports oriented or Jane and Finch oriented, which I really liked where we would actually have like the Jane and Finch um, street sign at the top there. Mm -hmm. um, it's something where like the community can really feel like they're owning it and they and it, the students feel like oh yeah i made this so it's like even better for them uh where they get to own it post it online show people and other people could come come out and see it so it, it was really cool it was really it was, it was really a shame that we didn't get to build it but it was cool yeah um i can also talk a little bit about the actual physical structure of it. So we gained, uh, went through a bunch of different iterations of what the photo booth could look like. Um, some people had come oh, right. up with the idea yeah. of just like a basic 
square structure or box structure with four different sides and people take pictures of it. Um, the challenges as we like noticed during our site visits was that the corner is very exposed um, and a lot of wind comes through that area. So having something very robust was really important, um, but also dynamic. Um, so they came up with the design with these kind of three corners. Um, you can see it on both the, the left and right. They, the left here, they've made little prototypes of it to kind of understand the scale of it, understanding how tall something can be uh, without it kind of toppling over and mm -hmm. how wide it needs to be. Um, with that being said, how it's like a windy space, they've also added um, some holes to the design, so to perforate the, the plywood pieces um, so that wind can pass through it. Um, and then they were also thinking of maybe using those holes as part of their right. actual backdrop design. Uh, so as TJ mentioned, like they thought about like maybe a, a nature focused one. So maybe using the perforated holes as uh, like stars and then in between the mm -hmm. two plywood pieces, you could put in lights to illuminate them. Um, and then as well as like the optical illusion, how are we able to use those, um, that perforation for that as well. Uh, so this is the, the design they had come up with. Um, and this was about like in March, late February. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were getting ready to start building and then, then COVID happened. So we uh, modified the program a little bit. Um, as TJ mentioned, unfortunately, we weren't able to build um, our the model as it wouldn't have been safe. Um, and we're actually postponing uh, quarter commons to next year as well. Uh, so still looking forward to building it then. Um, the build process or build phase was something that all of our participants were really interested in doing mm -hmm. and really excited about. Uh, so we definitely want to, to do that next year. Um, but to talk a little bit about how we kind of modified the program a little bit, we decided to do build online. Um, so each week we posted tutorials. Um, I would say this is about like May, June, July. Um, rather May and June, um, we posted tutorials to our Instagram because we found that that was a plat good platform to reach out to our students that our students were using all the time. Um, and uh, t focused on different design um, tools. So as TJ had mentioned, um, we didn't have too much time to focus on certain design programs that they were really interested in learning. Um, so this was an opportunity to really dive into them and uh, teach them a little bit more about them. Um, so we provided overviews of SketchUp and Photoshop and Illustrator as well. Um, and then also some drafting and rough um, mock-up model making. Um, and then throughout that process, we also continuously reached out to our participants. Um, we had a group chat where we were able to keep each other posted on kind of um, the designs uh, as well as the computer programs as well as like what else they would like to learn. Um, so we found that a lot of them wanted to learn a little bit more about Photoshop. Uh, we had a Photoshop subscription for the program so we were able to give them kind of the login information so they can work on it remotely if they would like. Um, and we also decided to do a design tutorial where we kind of just posted it rather than Zoom meetings because we found this was happening during school uh, as well. So it was a little bit hard to kind of all meet together at certain times, especially if um, people also had siblings who were needing to use the computer for, for school as well. Uh, so we decided that this format was probably the best for everybody. Um, and then after that, we also posted it on, on YouTube so that people can continue to watch them and refer to them um, as they go on. And then we'll talk a little bit about kind of what our project build team learned. Um, so throughout the, um, or the design tutorials, we constantly checked in to make sure that uh, they were doing well and that um, we were touching on topics that they were interested in. So some of the skills that they had built were hard skills like um, learning design tools like SketchUp and Photoshop and learning about uh, photography as well as research, but also skills like brainstorming and ideation, communication and problem solving through design and leadership and teamwork. Um, this entire process was done as a team and they came up with ideas together and bounced ideas off of each other. Um, and 
yeah, we wanted to to ensure that they were kind of working together throughout the entire process and also taking the lead on on this design. Um, this design is completely their own. Um, and we also asked them uh, a little bit of, of feedback of how we were doing at, in our pilot year. Many of them said that the, the skills uh, that they learned through this program would be beneficial for them in either future education or in their careers. Um, and they enjoyed the program overall. Um, some difficulties with the online components, um, just with in terms of access or timing of things um, or having being able to run certain programs um, all at the same time, um, which I guess can also lead into uh, kind of our key takeaways between uh, TJ and I. Um, yeah. yeah, TJ, if you want to start. Um, so one of the key takeaways I took in was, um, so again, since it was my first year, um, I didn't know how hard it was to get yeah. to, like, to outreach. I kind of walked in there blindly thinking like, oh, this is such a cool program Like a lot of people will be joining like like for sure and obviously that wasn't not obviously but that wasn't the case uh we did have a good amount of people sign up um but stuff like this i think is still rewarding because those that did show up um showed up every week type of thing and you could tell that they were engaged and they were interested um so that that was the really rewarding part but um aside from the outreach kind of like what ernestine was mentioning was um, especially when you're working in communities like this, they don't always have access or the tools or the resources to work on these things at home or to have tried these things. So it's really important to also have, um, to, keep, to keep that in mind and to also have like the funding and the tools, um, whereas they don't have to bring anything but themselves to the after, after school program, we would just provide everything for them, which I think they also like. Um, and another key takeaway was, uh, since they're coming from different schools in the area, I, I kind of really liked how uh, some of them, you could tell, were becoming friends, becoming closer. Some of them, even if they went to the same high school, maybe they didn't talk to each other then, but now they definitely do because now they have something that they share where they, they didn't know that they were both interested in uh, something, which I think is what a lot of high school students need, a little bit more um, direction and opportunity to see what they might not like, what they do like, so that uh, they meet other people through that um, way or form as well. Um, yeah, and I guess also for kind of key takeaways around our future iterations of project build, um, maybe thinking about alternative methods of delivering the mm -hmm. workshops, especially during these times uh, where we're not able to meet safely um, in a group setting, um, understanding that maybe online tutorials might be a useful way, a useful way of delivering the workshops, but there's obviously some, um, some barriers with that as well. Um, also the time commitment, we were quite ambitious with doing a June to, or sorry, an October to June timeline where we met every single week for two hours. Um, it is a lot of time commitment, um, and we think that maybe we can condense that uh, into a very like much shorter sessions um, where it's a little bit more intensive. Uh, and then also focusing and continuing with these community-oriented projects. So this year we focused on project or on Corner Commons uh, for them to design something, but maybe continuing and pushing that to um, in include further engagement and kind of that consistent uh, communication between community members on a project um, is something that we would like to explore more of. Uh, and just at the bottom here, I've also included our, some of our information so you can check out our social media. We're at build underscore JF on all the platforms. Um, and then we also have our website up there with more information. You can find our YouTube um, online tutorials on there as well. And if anyone has any questions, uh, our email is build at janefinchcenter.org. Sorry, I just wanted to add something. So, uh, sorry, one no more worries. key takeaway was, um, I, like when we were talking to the kids at first, you could tell that they were, like they were interested, but they were a little bit shy or hesitant to, to give us feedback or to tell us what they were feeling. But we noticed when, or at least I noticed that when Sala Robinson came, which was the um, person we invited, who's from the Jane and Finch community, they were very much more active. He's also very, like a very enthusiastic guy, which is good. But um, I think it's important for them to envision themselves and to also see role models who they 
could relate to and they could look up to as to um, someone who's just telling them things like, oh, hey, like we really want to help you out. We want to build something for the community. Whereas when it's someone from the community, it's a little bit more um, personal for them and they get to really relate to that. So I think that's really important too that um, I like that they were able to meet someone who took a different path into animation um, and stuff like that and was still able to be successful and then come back to the community and um, talk to the students. So that was cool. Yeah. And yeah, sorry, that's her thing. That's good. <laughs> Uh, we can do like a question and answer. Oh yeah. Now, if uh, like uh, I can do if anyone a, has if anyone has questions, uh, either unmute yourself or drop it into the chat. Uh, similar structure to yesterday, and then I can paste those into like a whiteboard so you can all see the question. Don't be shy. <laughs> I don't have a question, but it was an incredible presentation. And um, um, yeah, I'm really excited to see what you do next year once and hopefully when this pandemic is better managed and hopefully no longer in our realities, <laughs> God willing. Um, but um, I'm really excited to see what you do and I hope that our programs can come together in some way because it's really exciting to see another um, organization doing very similar work, um, but maybe different perspectives. So I, I think that's pretty cool and right. um, keep the great work. I just followed you on Instagram. I'm so excited to <laughs> stay uh, connected. Thank you. Yeah, we're really excited and hope that we can maybe do something together. Yeah. Thanks. We have a uh, question in chat from Mohammed, and just asking uh, what the name of your YouTube channel is. Yeah, so our YouTube channel is Our Green Change. Um, I believe that there might be another channel that exists right now that is called mm -hmm. Green Change. Um, that is not us. Our, you'll notice in our um, in our feed that there'll be it's the design tutorials in it, so you'll know that it's us if you see this. Um, and you can also find those um, same videos on Instagram as well, if you're interested. Um, our Instagram is build underscore JF. Uh, and they'll be there posted as IGTV videos. Sorry, I just wanted to, yeah, I put the, um, the link there as well. Okay, I think. I think you might have sent it to me. I wanted to know, is there um, any like other opportunities for new people to come into your programs to be a part of the second phase of the building? So actually that's what I was kind of, I thought would happen. Like once people saw us start building, maybe more people would be interested uh, in the hands-on stuff. Uh, I think we were always open to people joining in whenever um, and just filling them in and what, whatever happened. It just, I guess we didn't get to the build phase. We didn't get to see if more people would be interested, but I feel like for sure when you have something physical, like, Oh, Hey, we're going to this workshop where there's um, actual architects there doing their own thing as well. Um, if you want to come check that out, I'm, I'm pretty sure other students might've been interested, but it just didn't um, get to that phase sadly. Um, yeah. And as uh, TJ mentioned, unfortunately we didn't get to the building phase, but um, Corner Camp Commons is still happening next year. So we would still like to 
We're still going to be building the photo booth design from last year with participants. Um, and if anyone else wants to join that process, they definitely can. Um, you can reach us through our, our website um, as well as through our email, build at janefinchcenter.org. Um, and yeah, and we're definitely thinking of ways that we can still bring the program um, mm. into the world somehow during these times. Um, yeah, but if anyone wants to reach out to us, feel free. Oh, we were also thinking of incorporating um, smaller projects next year as well. Yes. So that it's not just a long term project that way if you join late or if you don't get to finish it. Uh, you don't kind of just miss everything that way if you have smaller projects you kind of get to. Um, you still go through the three phases, but it's in a much more um, condensed format. Mm -hmm. Yeah, having that kind of smaller scale building process. Um, one of the things that we had thought about um, was creating like little small build kits um, where you're able to, we'll provide different smaller tools mm -hmm. um, that people can use to build a smaller scale project, like a, like a planter box or right. um, something along those lines. Um, Uh, we have a question. So there's the a question in the chat, chat by Shulviga. Uh, if there wasn't a COVID, uh, do you folks uh, do a new project every year or after a project is done? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we would ideally be doing a new project every year, whether it be kind of within the same um, community focus. So whether it still be another component of Corner Commons or if we reach out to another community organization or community group or resident in the neighborhood that um, has a project in mind, we can partner with them and the group would um, design for them. Um, and typically we start, there's another uh, question coming in, when do you start the program? Uh, so for this year, we started in October, so in the fall. Um, I think we're still kind of exploring um, what that might look like um, come this year, uh, just because we are wanting to do kind of a smaller or a shorter timeline um, and also uh, would like to kind of see um, how kind of COVID <laughs> moves along. Mm -hmm. um, and another question that came in is, uh, where does the program take place? Um, so our program takes place out of our green change space, which is 2999 Jane Street. Um, it's located right behind the, the Jane Finch Mall. Uh, and then we had planned to do the building phase offsite um, at a local workshop, um, which was at, at Trade Links. Um, it was up by like Steels and Weston. Uh, yes, uh, another question. Do you guys do presentations at school? So if, uh, in the beginning from like September to November, uh, that's when we were doing a lot of uh, presentations and outreach. And we also did workshops at actual high schools uh, we only did a couple, only some uh, principals responded to us, so we only did a couple of workshops in those high schools, but we do uh, do presentations at, at schools for sure. Um, and I think that might also be something that we want to explore for the coming years of Project Build is how we can work with uh, schools. We found that it was a great format to run those workshops um, there, so uh, something that we might want to continue to look at. And we have a couple of comments in the chat as well from, I believe, Paul, right, Diana? Thank you. Congratulations, programmers who had to transition from on-site to online services know what a challenge, challenge it can be. Uh, Natasha also has a comment as well. I admire how you guys are, were adaptable despite the pandemic. Most programs ended up canceling, but you made changes based on the circumstances. I like how you ended up transitioning to online and work on students. Photoshop skills, still adding value to their lives in an otherwise disappointing circumstance. Thank you. Um, yeah, it was definitely something that we wanted to uh, 
really keep pushing. Um, we had promised uh, them that the program be running until June and we wanted to make sure that it was still um, meeting their needs and their interests throughout it all. Thank you. Uh, so at the event has a comment. Thank you for your presentation and your involvement in the Jane and Finch community. It is nice to see how this community continues to grow. I am also from the community. So it's nice to see these opportunities. That's awesome. That's kind of like why we why I was really looking forward to it in the first place to um, present kids or high school students with with these type of opportunities. I feel like when I was in high school, there wasn't anything like this that I wish uh, there was. So it's, it's, it was good, thank you. And if you're interested in, in learning more, let us know. <laughs> I actually have a question which might be a repeat of Shobiga's question, so I apologize. <laughs> um, but I, I wanted to figure, I want to learn how like, how do you decide what project to focus on each year? Like this year is the Creative Commons, maybe you're thinking about the Build Kit, kit next year. I'm wondering like how, like what, how do you make those decisions? Yeah, um, for the Corner Commons year, it was a little bit more of kind of like a, a natural um, transition into because we were working on them at the same time and had kind of the same um, timelines for both of them so it really did just work out um, nicely. I think for future years we definitely want to be engaging with the community uh, a lot more and learning a little bit more about what immediate needs or um, interests might be and then from there establishing what um, what projects can happen um, and also just understanding a little bit about what's or keeping an eye out on what's happening in the neighborhood as well um, right. to making sure that these projects are, are relevant to what's what's existing right now yeah. right I think also a lot of student input because uh, at the beginning, we also asked them if they knew of any places around the community that they felt could be improved or isn't being used to its full potential. Because uh, um, we, we wanted to make sure that the students are still from the community are still the ones that are um, kind of have a say or, or of what they want to make or what they want to improve in the community so that it's, it's made by them and for, and for them, essentially. Yeah, and I would just jump in to add that I think um, we're involved in a lot of the upcoming development projects that are happening across Jane Finch neighborhood and the surrounding area, um, looking to figure out how we can influence those projects directly from a community standpoint and supporting lots of uh, grassroots networks and other uh, groups in the neighborhood that are engaged. And so that's kind of part of what we're tracking as well and hoping that there's like design projects that are really tangible that we can do as interim steps as part of those development projects um, or to demonstrate in the case of Corner Commons, the potential to make sure a space is preserved um, and enhanced for the community as part of uh, the future redevelopment of the Jane Finch Mall, which is being planned over the coming 10 plus years. So that, that was the impetus for that particular project. So we imagine that more of those will <laughs> pop up as the neighborhood really experiences a lot of growth with the Finch LRT. Okay, so if you have any final comments or questions, please add them to the chat. In the meanwhile, thank you so much, Green Change team, for coming out to our first conference uh, ever. <laughs> we're so, like I said before, we're just so appreciative to see other folks doing similar works in different communities across Toronto. Uh, we're inspired by your work. We hope to continue to, to learn with you and grow with you. And I hope that some of our youth also join your program and build <laughs> experience as well. And we can start connecting. Uh, different communities together. Uh, I think that's pretty inspiring work. So congratulations on an amazing year uh, for being so resilient, uh, for being so innovative. And I know it's going to be a success uh, this year going into next year as well. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. And follow them on Instagram, folks, if you want to learn more. Uh, their contact information, I believe it's somewhere on this beautiful, um, this beautiful Q&A thing that Diana is rocking right now. Uh, so <laughs> please follow them. Stay, uh, stay in touch with them. 
email them, ask them questions. And yes, yeah, and show Miga. Yeah, thank you so much. I will definitely hope to attend this program next year. See, you already got one. <laughs> you have an amazing and inspiring, inspiring program. So that's really great. So we really thank you for coming out and spending time with us. Uh, and yes, all the best. So we are going to begin to transition to the next presentation. If you have to go, you have to go. We're not going to hold you uh, against your will. We are all friends here. Uh, the next presentation is, oh, can't get any sound. Oh, okay. I'm so, can everyone hear me? I'm so sorry. I don't know if I'm on mute or anything. Okay. I think it's something. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, we're going to uh, figure that out. Um, but. We're going to proceed to the next thing. I'm just going to make sure that person is ready uh, to present. Um, let me just check in if you're here. Yes. Okay, great. So Ernestine did put in the chat. If you have any questions or concerns, uh, just the email is there. So Shobiga, Athavan, if you're really interested in this program, uh, send them an email, send them a DM on Instagram so you can uh, stay in touch, okay? So just checking in with Elena, uh, just give me a thumbs up if you're good to go um, and so we can proceed. Okay, so we're gonna move on to our next presentation. Um, so it's the next one over. Um, and um, yes, like I said before, if you have to go because of any reason we understand, uh, but we're going to open up to our next partner, uh, which is led by Elena, who is also a co-facilitator of, of the um, Youth Architects Program. Uh, and we're going to just let her uh, lead the way. Go ahead, Elena. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm very glad to uh, be able to present our project, which is a continuation of the same uh, idea that we uh, <clears throat> that we developed with the Youth Architects Program. And um, uh, um, if it's possible, uh, can I share the screen? Yes, you should be able to share. Just share your screen and we'll kind of close the screen. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, we also uh, challenged ourselves, like uh, members of Lawrence Heights Art Center, which is a grassroots organization that was established about five years ago in Lawrence Heights. And uh, we uh, made a collective first. We get together, school sculptors, uh, artists, and uh, uh, myself, I'm an architect, and the musicians as well. We uh, started this uh, program uh, that was uh, making projects uh, by residents for the, for the residents of Lawrence Heights. And it was an interesting experience. Uh, and we got very um, excited about this possibility, which was provided to us by TCHC uh, on the verge of revitalization, where the um, few vacant units were available to, uh, to run programs like that. And um, since then, we were uh, interested, obviously, to uh, create larger space to accommodate more artists uh, as we discovered so many talents in the neighborhood. Um, and uh, we were thinking also to provide our uh, input in this whole idea of revitalization and creating new spaces for, uh, for local residents and uh, uh, creative people. And uh, I would like to present our take on the same uh, kind of idea of building pavilion for the second phase of revitalization. And uh, this uh, design was done by members of Lawrence Heights, more older members, artists, uh, workers, social workers who uh, like pr their profession, uh, some of them are social workers, then um, sculptors, architects and carpenters and all this stuff, all these people. Um, and we uh, called our pavilion uh, the Phoenix Rebirth of Lawrence Heights. Yeah, same thing. Okay. I'm not 
much. Okay. Yeah. So the main groups, uh, similar to the youth architects uh, divisions, uh, for the whole process, designing process, we have also designers, uh, which are represented by Lawrence Hyatt's art center team, and myself, uh, Elena Kornikova. Afilia Rally is an artist uh, whose imagery we would like to use uh, in our design as well, and uh, uh, it's a famous. Uh, uh, famous talent uh, we had her solo exhibition at City Hall a few years ago. She's incredibly, uh, she has incredibly powerful images uh, in her portfolio. Uh, then Olga Leinik is the uh, one of the team mem members. She is also uh, very creative. She's a musician herself, and uh, she has additional role uh, as well in our process as she had an experience to work with CCHC as a social worker. And then we have Herbie Blaine as well as a main consultant. He's an artist, uh, also uh, old residents of Florence Heights. And then among clients, we uh, have several groups actually. Uh, um, main group is uh, us, uh, as we wanted uh, to uh, increase uh, our potential and capacity. Um, I mean, us is uh, like all the artists and creative people who join uh, our projects before. Then uh, Saranac Artistic Community, it's uh, our uh, partners who are also, it's TCHC community neighboring with uh, Lawrence Heights. And we managed to uh, start um, together uh, with them uh, to start the new uh, group that became very solid and very uh, uh, like run around, like year around group, very, um, in, was in very interesting uh, results. They also had exhibition um, in Etobica. Uh, so they are using the glass as a medium. And so the paint on glass is the group uh, and they, uh, they call themselves inspiration. So this is another community, artistic community who would be uh, uh, among the clients who we will be building pavilion for. Then we have uh, uh, two groups, uh, additional groups, uh, it's a TCHC local offices. We wanted to create a new type of relationship with the workers as it seems like there's something is missing. We probably either don't have trust, full trust to each other, or we have too many complaints towards each other. And I was thinking that with our pavilion, we can also maybe provide some solutions to uh, resolve this uh, tension and some uh, uh, difficulties with them. And then there is another very interesting group that already uh, showing the collaboration between residents and TCHC. We wanted to support this initiative and also move it forward with our space that we uh, design for this group. And this is the uh, chart committee that organized and facilitated by uh, uh, residents and TCHC workers. And it was very interesting and very uh, promising uh, uh, experience, so we wanted to uh, bring it to the next level. So those groups are our um, major clients. And uh, in terms of location, we wanted to uh, uh, look at the space that uh, in the master plan uh, proposed as a central New Lawrence Hyde Park, which uh, um, will be uh, situated on the place where the school uh, facilities, elementary school, Fleming Elementary School, and I wanted to take advantage of this uh, specifically uh, of that place uh, where there is a, a change of levels, uh, as you can see uh, from the bottom part, uh, you can see the uh, uh, geographical kind of landscape, how it mo moves up. So I was thinking it would be nice to have a kind of a terrace uh, uh, pavilion that uh, can have also this uh, lower level uh, for the specific purposes, and which I explain later. And uh, for now, if uh, for those of you who are familiar with the uh, with this location, uh, probably it won't need to explain that much. But for others, um, it's a space like the lower space uh, belongs to the uh, facility, school facilities right, right now, and the top uh, adjacent area it's uh, starting like the place where the housing uh, units now, and that will be uh, changed for the park area. I'm not sure if, if the uh, levels will be uh, actually flattened or they will remain uh, the way it is. It would be great if we can s save this uh, uh, geographical feature so we can uh, kind of have our own identity, also landscape identity uh, in our future uh, phases of revitalization. 
And uh, this is the image and the story behind the building. Uh, we have this amazing artist, Ophelia, and this is one of her uh, images that for us uh, become kind of a, uh, became iconic image. Uh, and we call it Phoenix. And that's how we wanted to call our pavilion as well, because it's, uh, we're looking at the, at the pavilion as a space of inspiration. And just like the Phoenix rising from, uh, from the ashes, uh, the pavilion symbolizes for us also uh, as rise of new horizons of creativity, hopes and possibilities. And now, uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Ola Olinek. I am uh, uh, one of the participants in the L, um, the LHAC, the um, and also the <clears throat> uh, social worker. Um, I was uh, facilitating uh, a home run scholars program uh, for grade one to five, doing homework and. Uh, playing uh, different um, active and uh, um, uh, quiet games and crafts and stuff. So um, as um, uh, I, I would like to present that um, the uh, requests uh, from all these organizations, including the um, residence um, uh, was the is the gallery and the workshop spaces for the um, Lawrence Heights Art Center members and um, individuals artists and the gallery for neighboring Sarana community artists of inspiration uh, paint on glass group and another uh, clients, uh, consultants, uh, the TCHC offices, the maintenance uh, who want comfortable and, and inspirational modern and accessible offices and waiting areas for themselves, uh, revive office, the chart programs, conference room, and the Heritage Museum is what they would like to have uh, uh, um, spaces for. Then safety unit, parking for security and office space, and the um, uh, the Home Run Scholars Program, uh, the outdoor and in indoor equipped spaces uh, for one to five grade, uh, gardening and kitchen spaces, and then also area for parents to observe and participate to tighten the community and, and care for kids. And the uh, collaborative strategies, uh, a showcase of um, uh, uh, model uh, of um, Lawrence Heights Art Center at open house to potential users. Um, discussions with maintenance staff about the possible maintenance challenges um, and the outreach to TCHC managers and round tables with decision makers uh, to continue the talk of uh, uh, use of space and necessary space. And design ideas in the programs, uh, how does the design concept meet the needs? Well, that would be the question. So the circular flow around the in, in, enclosed uh, green island uh, on, on, the, on, on the top level, the various scales, shapes, and light characteristics of spaces, the TCHC services coexist with grassroots in harmony, and uh, who are the users of the pavilion, the residents, the TCHC workers, and tourists or visitors. Uh, what does the pavilion offer? Uh, the generous gallery space, a rooftop deck, uh, various studio workshop spaces, conference rooms and offices, and we were also talking about um, some kind of lunch uh, uh, area for um, lunch or the, the, the kitchen with a bit of a sitting area uh, for people to have quiet time and rest. Yes. So now we can uh, show the uh, design iterations uh, supporting uh, and illustrate what we just said as a and design ideas. So um, we're planning to have three floors all together. And uh, as you see, there is an area um, uh, in front, like uh, on the, uh, like the, the front side of the building, we see this very transparent glass structure uh, and the wall that penetrates it coming from outside, inserting the building and coming out on the other side. And the idea of this wall, uh, not only to create larger surfaces for the display of artwork and uh, create some interesting shape inside, 
uh, and uh, but also to divide this uh, gallery space from the office area, uh, which you can see on the floor plans, uh, these um, outlines like black uh, outlines. So um, this area will be divided uh, on three floors vertically, whereas the uh, front piece is uh, open all the way up and it creates even on the third floor, if you look at the third floor plan, it has a gallery deck that also connected with the main uh, gallery space as well and may, can be as a continuation of the exhibition. Uh, it is connected by the staircase, this round circle uh, staircase that uh, connects in all these three levels and uh, also plays kind of uh, attraction point to explore the space. Uh, since it's uh, kind of unusual and open and, and half hidden, half open kind of for the um, And here you can see the um, this is uh, like I made this uh, maybe a rough sketch of uh, of the space inside the gallery. And uh, since the uh, galleries um, have this glass um, shell, so it is um, open space. It feels like it's connected with the uh, outer landscape as well. Uh, as so as you, as you seen, the spaces are very different and they're very diverse and in, enjoyable. In different, so the experience can be very uh, diverse and very dynamic uh, throughout the, the whole building. So here's this uh, color code diagram. It's how the whole uh, spaces are envisioned from the from top to uh, from the top to bottom, or from the bottom to top. Uh, so we start with the first level, and um, uh, the first uh, the ground level. We are thinking of this uh, blue spaces for the housing, and uh, it's kind of uh, reminiscent what we have now. Uh, with the exception that it gives this uh, uh, middle kind of green island uh, that we envisioned uh, with the plants and interesting design, natural design, uh, since it, it will be uh, backlit with the natural light in the um, Sorry, is, is the, do you hear me? I'm not sure. If we can hear you. Sometimes the yeah. sound gets a bit fuzzy. Um, okay, good. So yeah. Um, yeah, so, um, so the, these uh, TCHD offices would uh, be sur uh, surrounding this island, we call it an island in this case. And then uh, the red uh, box represents the common spaces where uh, different groups of residents can use for different uh, gathering rooms. Or they also will be facing both to the gal uh, well to the gallery as well to close, but uh, it will face this uh, island with um, so that will provide this kind of connectivity between residents and workers to have it more uh, um, more harmony between in their relationship, I guess. So uh, we're hoping that it may work uh, better. So it's uh, allocated to the uh, chart. Uh, programs and lock programs, and I was uh, uh, thinking that would be great also for different groups of um, who have a uh, variety of uh, experiences and spaces uh, to do the artwork as well. So in this case, the second floor we offer this deck, roof deck, uh, that uh, you can uh, exit from the workshop and use it as an outdoor space to continue uh, working on the project that needs outdoor space for that, like um, uh, sort of uh, what LAC members did so far on the neighborhood, like uh, Sunset Bench and the office we built outside our world. So that would be the uh, adequate space to do some kind of uh, work with the uh, heavy materials, heavy duty tools in and um, then the third floor, uh, as I said before, uh, we envisioned as a it could actually uh, connect with the main gallery space and can be additional uh, uh, component to the exhibition. And also, it can uh, have a gardening space like green garden, 
as well as if it's, uh, if it's like envisioned that there'll be light from, from the ceiling as well, from the virtual light. So uh, once we cover it with this the glass wall on top, it will be in the final light. Uh, and in this uh, diagram, we see how uh, we have many entrances, so it's very accessible. We have several uh, elevators inside the division, there are several washrooms, and um, the girls will enjoy the running up and down the staircase. So it will be this beautiful school. Uh, Place as well as part of the uh, exhibition place. And um, the main entrance also to the exhibition will also decorate this uh, front side of the building. But those were just a few additional uh, diagrams how it would look from the uh, human point of view from uh, with the human perspective. Uh, and it shows that this is the there is a island in the middle of the um, space which will connect uh, different groups of uh, of clients that we have in mind. And the proposed location again, just to remind uh, how uh, how it may fit in this uh, uh, two levels with the parking. Uh, lot, the ground parking lot. Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't have the uh, right uh, images right now to show this uh, idea of the terraces, like of different levels of the building. Um, and here's the little uh, rendering of the model that we build also uh, uh, illustrating the, the space that we envision. So those are spaces for the housing, uh, for the TCHC, and those levels uh, with the uh, rooftop and uh, the shade above. And those are the first visitors coming to our exhibitions. Um, so, how is the Phoenix in the design? I would like to get a little bit back to the beginning as well. Seems like we got lost the whole idea, the story of the uh, of the pavilion. So here, the idea of uh, including incorporating the uh, affiliate image of Phoenix, uh, we envision it as a projection on this wall. Uh, and it allows for the image to become like transformed through the image into the 3D installation. And we thought it would be great, it will be visible from outside and it will be very powerful, um, very powerful image uh, uh, once it's scaled to that uh, extent. And so the last, uh, the last word. Uh, the client's feedback is the um, what we already heard. Uh, the clients and residents of TCHT, um, the um, Lawrence Heights Art Center members, uh, they want to have their workshop spaces and they uh, agreed how they want the layout to be. And then it, the... Saranak Artists uh, Inspiration Group, uh, um, we got the feedback from, and the, the maintenance agreed that they want the comfortable and, I mean, their space looks comfortable and inspirational and modern and accessible offices and waiting area. And um, as we discussed uh, with Elena, how the home run scholars program can have the indoor and outdoor equipped spaces and the kitchen and the parents area to observe and participate and tighten the community. And and the gardening space so children can also participate and grow food and see um, for themselves. But the two other uh, groups we haven't heard yet is the Revite Office, the Chart Program Conference Room, and what they want. Um, 
and the safety unit want the parking for security and the office space. Um, it, it's, it's also there, but they, we didn't hear back from them about the design and, and how they see it uh, happen for them if they are happy. Yeah, so this would be the end of our uh, presentation and we welcome and open to answer any questions and uh, we'll be very happy if you, anyone can show uh, uh, specific interest in details and features of our Thank you. Thank you. I didn't catch a tail end what you said, Elena, but we are going to move into Q and A. Uh, so Diana will lead that part as well. Thank you, Diana. Um, any questions or comments? You're free to unmute yourself or type it in the chat as per usual. Um, I would like to answer some questions that I already. Um, uh, in terms of accessibility and uh, seniors' room, uh, I mentioned that the first le level was dedicated to these uh, common spaces for all the other groups who would like to enjoy the space as well. So it was right uh, uh, opposite from TCH on this island. I envisioned that um, all the groups, especially those who need to speak, they will be uh, able to discuss. Uh, floor, ground floor, um, and um, yeah, the sound is going in and out, Elena. I, I don't know if Diana was able to capture everything you just said. Um, so, if you asked a question, um, you could type it in the chat just in case we miss anything. Let us know. Okay, I, I, I'm not sure if I can do it at the same time. Okay, so I can yeah. say uh, I'll try to speak. Uh, you can hear it now. It's, I don't think it's you. There's some sort of feedback that I'm hearing sometimes when you talk. It's very fuzzy, and then you break out in, in and out. But right now, I can hear you quite, quite okay. So maybe try. All right. So just to repeat to the poll question, uh, the uh, first floor is uh, specifically uh, dedicated to all these uh, vulnerable groups and uh, low accessibility groups. And we envision it the few uh, larger and smaller spaces that can be used fully by the uh, either seniors and uh, there might be some other organizations like parents organization or uh, any others uh, that are uh, uh, fully uh, allocated to this kind of program. Um, yes, yeah, so the second floor was uh, meant for the more specific cultural programs and the third floor was the gardening space. And we also, uh, we also include elevators uh, inside in the structure and, um, and um, well, we don't have ramps, uh, but uh, yeah, elevators are there if it's necessary to reach out to the, to reach the garden space as well or any other facilities. And the gallery space, which is, uh, I would say, 50% of the building, it's, uh, it's fully accessible. It has uh, main uh, entrance and uh, two other entrances uh, through the sides as well. Um, moving to the other questions, I'm trying to see what else was asked. Did you mention anything about, I, I may have missed it, about the Phoenix and how that's going to be just displayed within uh, the pavilion? Yeah, it was the last, uh, very last slide about we planning to project this uh, beautiful image on top of this meandering wall uh, of, the, uh, of the gallery. We did this experiment already, uh, kind of test for us, but uh, in the city hall where we uh, displayed Ophelia's artwork on the re retaining wall of the second floor of the city hall rotunda and it looked great and it was uh, that was moving image and it proved that uh, Ophelia's artwork uh, looked amazing when it is scaled up and uh, screened on this large canvases. Any other questions? I was 
I was hoping that if we have any uh, representatives of those groups that we envisioned as our potential clients as a revised office or um, other CCHC groups, it would be great to hear from them if they have any concerns or, uh, uh, or comments with regards to the design that we proposed. There is a question in the chat uh, from Bruno Weber. Um, thank you for the presentation. Strong geometric shapes creating interesting point of tension between the forms. Can you speak to the surface materials proposed for the undulating walls? Well, the, uh, I was thinking for two possibilities. One is like a very uh, first that comes to mind is uh, it could be the, the wool, uh, the retain, um, the meandering wall could be uh, the simplest solution probably would be the concrete uh, material. But then uh, I also did a few iterations like uh, with the material uh, when we were making model. Um, we also used wood uh, texture. So it might be interesting also to consider some composite materials um, to provide this very neutral uh, kind of background for the artwork that can be displayed. Um, and uh, for the rest of the structure, it would uh, it would be the uh, probably uh, most popular technology uh, with the metal frames and the uh, filling the concrete uh, slabs. And we wanted to have, an, as you seen at the uh, final model, uh, actual model, we envision this uh, roof. Uh, with the, uh, like glass roof with tinted glass and that can be controlled uh, for the light, uh, how like how to diffuse and how to distribute the light so it won't be uh, killing the uh, visitors. And uh, uh, that would be the uh, large uh, cover uh, with this um, structure, metal structure. So, uh, kind of industrial look, but we, we think it, it might be interesting and modern uh, kind of, uh, uh, feature that we would like to explore as well. I hope I answered the question. Uh, um, yeah, we were I'm talking about the seniors. Uh, also about the the rooms for seniors, right? Yeah, I I explained about the yeah uh, that um, yeah. the very first floor I showed the first diagram with the red uh, box. It was uh, um, it's the space that uh, next to the wall on the first floor, and it has very interesting shapes. That it actually it's round shapes as well. It's very uh, uh, easy to move around with the wheelchairs. It doesn't have like sharp corners. Uh, because this meandering wall, it creates this very wavy and very uh, uh, kind of um, uh, nice and smooth uh, path. And uh, in turn, uh, I see this additional comment in terms of the extension, that level extension. Unfortunately, I didn't make it. To, uh, I have it in the model. I just didn't take the shots from the back side. So what we have uh, in the real model, we're using these changes of, uh, of the levels of the landscape. Uh, so the back side where the TCHT office is um, uh, locate, uh, locating, they, uh, we have this under, uh, under the office's garage. So we have this parking spot that you were thinking of. Uh, the safety unit could take advantage and also the uh, cars for the uh, offices as well for the workers uh, would be uh, um, easily stored there. And it will uh, save the space and uh, also create very interesting uh, uh, facade, the, the front view of this backside. Unfortunately, I don't have the picture of it. it we have it in the model and I'm uh, planning to uh, showcase it very soon at, at, at our next open house at Lawrence Heights Art Center. So everyone can uh, see it uh, and even we can disassemble the model and assemble it. it. It's built in a way that everyone can explore it. How is it structured inside as well? So you're welcome to come uh, to the uh, to our open house and uh, see all this um, 
possibilities that we created in our design um, in, terms of, in terms of the landscape uh, use, use of landscape features. Mm -hmm. I really like that green top part of your design. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Elena, do you know the like, time date of your open house? And I can just drop it here. Uh, well, we're planning to have it really uh, soon within the next month. It's probably, uh, it most likely will be at the end of September. Uh, we don't have the uh, exact date yet. Right. Yeah, we, will, we will be uh, sending out the invitation. I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Like I find it very interesting, uh, reflecting on the youth presentation from yesterday, their pavilions and your pavilion as well. Elena, with um, your other uh, collaborators and designers and people that you work with, um, lots of great similarities in terms of like the needs, in terms of like the art space and having like certain things like that that keep on coming up. Um, I think it's a it's a really good example of how these needs keep on being uh, resurfaced, even with different sets of clients. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, if you have any comments or final questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, and then, um, yes, there's also the contact info. Um, there. I have a question. Uh, I was wondering how if so there's about i think uh four maybe five spaces sorry i didn't count um Wait, yeah there are three main uh floors and we have this uh changing level floor uh underneath for the garage yeah. so and how many are, all right and uh would they be all used at once so is this like is the pavilion able to accommodate uh so many people or is it like uh, in terms of like noise, because I know there's different groups uh, that would be using it all together. Well, uh, yeah, that, uh, that's what we are uh, achieving with this uh, wall, the, for, like the main division between the spaces, office spaces and the gallery, where the most uh, public spaces will be with this wall. That will provide the uh, noise uh, isolation probably uh, and the major division. And then for the uh, offices, uh, we think that uh, we usually, uh, the, like the office workers, they will be able to use the space during the working hours. And then after work, after their work, the, the uh, use of the rooftop will be probably most uh, active uh, because that's how uh, like after four or like home run school program starts after school. And so they will be able to use the, uh, the next floor very easily and it won't be interfering with the workers uh, who will be already uh, finishing by the time their work. So, and then uh, gallery space and uh, uh, other spaces that will be available for the all day long. And uh, uh, since we have this island in the middle, uh, so it won't, uh, they won't be uh, immediately connected like uh, wall to wall. Uh, there will be space that will be kind of uh, giving this uh, uh, cushion kind of for the noise and for the um, any other problems that might arise when people are too close to each other and different uh, moving in different directions and really kind of crowd and stuff. And plus, mm -hmm. our building has uh, four entrances. I mean, four sides for the entrances. So it will be very easy to avoid uh, interfering if it's not necessary as well. Mm. Uh, so offices will have their own uh, entrances and then uh, the gallery has its own entrance and then you have cross entrance, like a kind of a channel where the, also the all um, uh, circulation can uh, kind of uh, accommodate the different, different direction moves uh, and uh, 
So we have different channels to uh, separate those uh, um, mm -hmm. the circulation of the public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's well thought of them. <laughs> Yeah, and I was thinking maybe also the architectural um, solution would be maybe in the material that they are using um, to build the walls and, you know, soundproofing or something. Good idea, though, to, to, to know all of it in advance. We're still uh, looking at it as the work in progress project, and uh, it was really exciting to collect all these ideas and the requests and uh, transform them and envision them in and kind of materialize them in, in the civil, like the uh, solution wise. And but still, we we, we understand we we far from the uh, like ideal space that probably solve all all the problems. Uh, but we're feeling like we're moving toward this direction and we're very excited to uh, get more participants who would like to uh, give their insights and give their experiences uh, for uh, improving what we have already. Yeah. That's great, Lena. So how can more folks get involved in this, in this work that you're doing with the Lawrence Heights Art Center? Uh, there are many ways to participate in our programs. You can just visit us uh, and uh, talk with us and uh, maybe become part of this kind of brainstorming sessions. Uh, they're also very interested uh, in the talented, in the people who, who possess skills like drawing skills or uh, modeling skills or any other uh, skills uh, that can be uh, used. And it's actually the scope of those skills that can be used for the design. It, it's enormous, it's not just drawing. And there are many uh, uh, programs, programs, and there are many um, projects that can uh, inter intersect and uh, enhance the whole concept of the design uh, from different areas like science areas or um, from, I don't know, uh, many, many different things like literature or history, or like you have a very uh, strong legacy for the Lawrence Heights, like history of the, of the place and um, dynamics, uh, its own dynamics, historical dynamics, and many other things which also can contribute uh, immensely in the uh, whole idea of the, of the pavilion. And uh, whoever has any information and would like to share with us that uh, could be done either by visiting the center or we can also, we have the website and we can communicate through website where we update uh, very often our projects. Like, and so we're very interested in comments to those projects. And we have uh, online connection uh, and blogs and um, other ways to, of communication. And uh, yeah, it would be great if someone uh, like handy people, they can actually build something and uh, do it with their own uh, uh, participation, really like hands-on participation. Kind of. We're very happy for like being with the, uh, our team. Yeah, because we have very many projects and we, we need more people to participate to achieve what we envision. If there are any other visionaries in the neighborhood would be very good to, to have them on board. Well, great. Congratulations, Elena, on this amazing uh, proposal um, and also all your work with the Youth Architects Program. You are definitely major leader in the Lawrence Heights community among many. Um, I'm really happy to have you. Um, and yes, we need more folks to continue to reach out and uh, to share their gifts. This is very incredible work. So uh, congratulations. Um, and yes, definitely check out her website. Uh, there's lots of great information on there as well about the work that she's did over the couple, past couple of years. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much, Elena, and thank you uh, for presenting. Yeah, thank you.
And if you didn't get a chance to ask a question, but you have something on your mind, Elena's information, her contact information is on this whiteboard. Uh, maybe we can also copy and paste it and put it into the chat at some point. Um, and you're more than welcome to connect with her there. Um, I just want to make a very short comment. Uh, I noticed that there was the wrong address put on the uh, whiteboard. It's not 800 anymore. We moved a few years ago. It's 83 Varna. 83 Varna Drive, the address of the Orthodox Heights Art Center. Yeah. Okay. And uh, we work in usually every day, uh, well, not now, uh, obviously with this uh, situation with the uh, lockout, but uh, uh, in the normal situation, we usually work uh, on weekends and uh, uh, so yeah, anytime. We're always available. Okay, so um, yep, yeah, it's so fascinating, inspiring to see and be a part of this project. That's great. I'm happy you're part of the project. Um, we are going to begin to transition, as I said before, it is a pretty long conference. So if you have to go, you have to go. Uh, the next piece is our round table discussion. We're gonna just have an open discussion as a group um, around how do we build sustainable communities, uh, more so focusing in how do we support residents and stakeholders and various uh, decision-making bodies of people uh, to work together uh, to collaborate and re-envision their communities. Uh, for example, as many of you know, as many as of you know, uh, Lawrence Heights is going through a revitalization process. So we want to kind of think about these kind of communities that are going through this ma mass amount of change. How do we support residents and also stakeholders to work together uh, to reimagine their communities together? So we are going to segue into that portion of the uh, event. Um, and yes, as I mentioned, uh, if you have to go, thank you so much for joining uh, with us for the conference. I really appreciate you. We're going to send more information about the conference in, the e in your emails very soon. Um, and yeah, I guess we can begin shortly. Um, I'm just going to give a minute or two for folks that may have to leave uh, to exit um, and also folks that are coming in. Okay, I guess we can begin, right, Elena? Are we good to go? Yep. I just so. wanted to give everyone a second just to uh, hoost off if you needed to. <laughs> and if you need to get a glass of water, uh, hydrate, please do. We don't we want to make sure you take care of yourself. It's very important to do that. Or if you turn through camera, you're more than welcome to. Uh, everyone's welcomed as they are. Um, the first part, before we even get into this little slide deck and questions um, and just opening up the discussion, it will be a big group discussion. Uh, so everyone's welcome to unmute themselves or chat in the chat. Um, and I also want to just mention before we even get into this, um, I am not an expert on this topic. I am learning just like everyone else in this group. Uh, we hope that we get a chance to um, just join in and share knowledge and wisdom together. So I just want to be mindful that um, I don't hold the power and the knowledge on this topic that our hopes is that we're sharing knowledge and we're sharing experiences and sharing the wisdom around the circle. If we ask a question and it doesn't make sense, we can rephrase it. We can go in a completely different direction. Uh, it's just more so for us to open up and to brainstorm ways of how we can actually build uh, stronger or sustainable communities. So the first part, uh, you can either chat or you can unmute yourself if you like. <laughs> um, I'm going to invite you to uh, introduce yourselves, 
uh, your affiliation, if you are a student, if you're an architect, if you have a particular profession that you would like to highlight, um, and also what you feel is a sustainable community. Um, so maybe I should type that so people can hear, actually remember what I just said, but your name, your affiliation, your pronoun, um, and what you feel uh, makes a sustainable community. Um, so you're more than welcome to unmute yourself. If we need to break the ice, we can, but anyone else can go. We don't have to go because we are talking first. Sure, I'll unmute myself and go first, even though I probably just jumped in last. Thank you, Katie. <laughs> Hey, Joy. Good to hey. see you. Hi, Diana. Nice to see your face as well. I've heard a lot about you over the summer. Um, and thank you for inviting me to join the conversation today. My name is Kadeen Bankasing. I go by she, her, and I am a resident of the Lawrence Heights Neptune community. Um, I've been here for about 12, almost 13 years with my children, and so revitalization has uh, been a very large part of my world for many, many years. Um, so I'm very excited to hear what others will share and the ideas and any ideas that come up around how we can continue to build our community uh, together and sustainably will be very helpful. We are moving into a significant uh, juncture, if you will, in the progress of the revitalization this coming fall. So it's really important to keep community members, our young people who are so talented and innovative, involved in how our community will be built and how it will change and what it will look like in years to come. So thank you for all your work. Hey guys, can you hear me? Hi. Yes, so, hi. Hi, my name's Ashish and um, I'm an architect. I work with Zeidler Architecture. Um, I am a recent graduate as well, finished my master's degree uh, sometime last year. And since then I've worked on a lot of uh, commercial and healthcare projects. And it's an honor to be here speaking at this round table. Hopefully we all learn a lot and you know, give a lot to the younger ones to you know think about um yeah you talked about briefly what is a sustainable <coughs> community and i feel like it's something that goes way past architecture it's something we need to all you know try to relate with on a day-to-day -day basis um, there are little habits we could also try to change um it could it goes all the way from little habits all the way to like the huge things that you do in buildings, you know, to make the, or even say urban planning, you know, to make all these changes. So yeah, it would be an interesting discussion and nice to meet everyone. Maybe I'll go next. Um, I'm Joy, for those of you who don't know, Joy Brown. I work at North York Community House as a youth worker um, and pronoun she, her, and joyful one. And it's so funny, we actually, we actually wrote down this question and I don't even know how to answer it myself. <laughs> um, but for sure, I think that how to build, uh, what, is a, uh, what makes a community sustainable? Um, I think there's so many things, but I think I wanna focus on one thing. Um, I, I feel like, just like, I can't even find the right word, but it's it's almost like residents just coming together and um, and just speaking out and being active and being supported. 
Um, I know that's just one aspect, but I, I feel like when I've been in those kind of communities where residents will come together and organize and, and advocate, um, I realized those communities were very strong and close knit and had really great values. So that's the one thing that stands out to me as to what makes a community strong or sustainable is having that strong sense of close knit uh, community that is willing to come together to advocate uh, to support one another and to speak out against any kind of injustice or things that are going on, th things that are going on in the community. How about you, Elena? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Elena. I'm with the residence of uh, Lawrence Heights, and I am also artist and. Uh, um, lead of the uh, Lawrence Heights Art Center. Uh, it's a residence-led uh, collective uh, organization and we're very happy to uh, make our projects uh, for residents as well for our neighbors. So it gives us a very uh, special kind of uh, experience and special feeling. Um, yeah, so that's what motivates us and inspires us uh, in our project, obviously. Yeah. Um, I, I'm Olya Olinik. I am a participant at the Lawrence Heights uh, Art Center. And I, for me, sustainability, um, I think everything that Joy said is absolutely um, precise. I, I believe it's when the communities um, can support each other, can benefit from each other, like kind of make um, lives better for themselves and others in their community um that would be the the, the model of sustainability so i can introduce myself uh as well i'm uh, vesta i'm actually in montreal right now um i'm elena's daughter and uh i hear a lot about all everything going on in lawrence heights through my mom, um, but I also visit sometimes. So I kind of uh, I've seen the neighborhood. I, I've seen uh, like the, yeah, the streets and the park, uh, the garden. Um, so I think that uh, a sustainable community um, is about building relationships and kind of knowing people around you and feeling comfortable speaking to other people. Um, and just that kind of makes you feel at home when I guess when you have uh, like a, a, a network of people that you can, you know, feel like you trust and, and see maybe on a day to day basis even so yeah, any kind of projects or activities that encourage people to communicate with each other more, I think will make a stronger community and allow for like innovation and new new projects and hopes and friendships and yeah Hi, um, my name is Shavika. I'm also, I'm part of the Youth Architects program. Um, I use pronouns she and her. And so, like everyone was saying, what I think makes a sustainable community is allowing everyone to being active members. So we should be able to come together as a community and acknowledge our needs, both uh, socially, economically, and environmentally. And so everyone should have their own voice and have their own network with the community members to allow strong relationships and goals to prosper together. Yeah.
Okay, so um, I know we didn't all get a chance to introduce ourselves, but that's totally fine. Well, what we're going to do is actually eventually go into smaller groups because we realized we had a lot more people than imagined, which is good. It's all great. Um, so in the small groups, hopefully we'll get a chance to just uh, go through everyone to, to say their names and, uh, and what they think around that. But let's actually move into the slide deck more just so we can get into our small groups and actually begin to have a discussion. So did that, do you want to go into this, Elena, since this is your slide? Not sure if you're there. Okay, I'm going to go into it. Uh, definitions. Uh, so in terms of building uh, sustainable communities and the way that Elena has been envisioning this is that it uh, incorporates the environment and the social relationships in the community. And also the community, we look at that as a professional, the professional environment and also the geographical location of the community. So our approach is basically merging them together. We want to look at the location. We want to look at professionals in the field. We want to look at the environment uh, and merge it together to, to build a better strategy in terms of supporting residents and various stakeholders uh, to work uh, better together to re-envision their communities. So some of the, pro some of the program lessons from our youth architects program, we saw there's a lot of benefits to building that capacity uh, of residents and youth, uh, and um, also building upon their strengths, um, and then utilizing the strengths and and their and their vision to build or to design a common space like the, like the pavilion design. Uh, we would like to also uh, consider the capacity of the community and build on the assets of the community. Uh, and uh, uh, for that purposes, we wanted also to refer our um, projects of building pavilion and any other participation in the revitalization and look at it as the actually like experimental hub rather than just waiting for the uh, whole process to be finished uh, and concluded. So we were thinking of this possibility uh, to get uh, the advantage of the revitalization process itself during the kind of building and construction and uh, maybe to start participate more actively and more uh, widely in the process not only as a, since we have uh, some apprenticeship in the construction side trades uh, we also would like to consider designing trades as well and designing uh, opportunities for the artists and uh, youth architects and other um, skill, uh, skillful people, how they can uh, be incorporated, how their skills can be incorporated in the process of design. So, uh, so we see it as a transformation from this kind of uh, annoying and uh, difficult time and uh, tra transform it in the enjoyable time and uh, uh, not waiting for the uh, revitalization to be over. Uh, so uh, this was the whole idea behind all this uh, initiative of collaboration and of this uh, visionary participation um, of the residency. And in this case, you're also are looking for the uh, uh, relationships uh, to build a stronger relationship and more productive relationship with the city and decision makers. Yeah. So I'm thinking at this point, uh, we're going to break out into breakout rooms and we're going to go through the three questions and then we're going to come back to do the final activity uh, the, together. Okay, Diana, Elena? Yep. Okay, so Diana, Lena, I'm gonna put you together and I'm gonna be on my own and I'll be fine, okay? So you should be receiving a breakout room invitation right about now.
Then uh, could you please uh, share the screen with us so we can see the questions? Thank you. Yeah, so the... Um, Uh, with this question, we wanted to uh, share the experiences, uh, like positive and negative experiences, and maybe uh, see how we can use the positive and how we can uh, avoid negative. So um, we invite in everyone who ever had anything uh, valuable to share with us. So in this, I'm just wondering what, what city official would sort of meant, I guess, by that. Uh, well, uh, whoever is in, in included in this whole revitalization office, uh, we were thinking of uh, various uh, probably uh, participants from different departments. Like uh, for myself, I'm aware of different departments such as uh, uh, forestry and recreation, urban planning, uh, both like general, like citywide and the North York um, departments and uh, um, probably social development department as well as, as DFA. I guess all of them, they're part of this uh, common decisions about the uh, neighborhood uh, strategies and how they can be improved. And uh, we actually, uh, we're planning to discuss also this uh, implementation of this uh, neighborhood strat new neighborhood strategy uh, uh, document that uh, invites communities to have uh, much more uh, active and much more inf impactful uh, uh, standing point. And uh, we were thinking that maybe our initiative with this project, Pavilion Project, would be one of those examples how to implement those strategies. And we wanted to know what uh, people from those departments uh, think about it. Like, how would it be uh, possible to develop uh, new, uh, maybe new channels uh, of this participation and collaboration? Like, what what would be the reaction on those uh, initiatives that we're proposing, for example, or maybe some other uh, people uh, had other experiences similar to ours. Uh, where the uh, barriers were uh, like systematic barriers may prevent from this uh, sufficient collaboration. And uh, so we would like to look at it from different, uh, different views and try to learn and maybe build something new, uh, more successful uh, practices. So, for example, Derek, uh, I was thinking for, uh, for you, uh, for your experience as a um, uh, as a worker, uh, what would you uh, value the most from the resident side, and what you think were uh, um, important contributions? Like, uh, were there any, or maybe there were some efforts and it didn't succeed, or uh, how did it go in different projects? So we're trying to find those uh, best solutions for that collaboration. Because so far myself, I found it very difficult to uh, uh, reach out to these uh, departments because they have the very strict and very uh, um, different agenda. And so for us, we kind of lost first there's so many departments and it's very difficult to navigate what people and who, uh, what they're responsible for and whom we should address. Uh, our questions or our proposals or whatever. So I found this part, for example, very um, uh, insufficient. And uh, I was thinking what what might be change and how we can together change something. So our communication will be uh, two ways, uh, more direct and more um, uh, like faster and more uh, uh, effective. Yeah. I I think that um, I think that I, I can speak sort of generally because I worked for city planning for a couple of years and I work now I work, I work for TCHC. Um, but with city planning, you know, we had a lot of there were always public meetings, but they were usually just kind of um, um, sort of reactions in a way. They were reactions to 
there were there were statutory public meetings around um, new development applications usually, and so these were kind of very formal town, you know, off, often kind of formalized town hall type meetings. Um, and it wasn't, in my opinion, it wasn't really the best way to get, uh, it was, it was, well, often they were very focused on very specific developments. And, and when it comes to the, these sort of, um, I guess, bigger picture community planning type things, there were consultations, um, you know, there's sort of long range planning consultations, but I, I think those are, you know, those, those, those meetings and those events are avenues, but um, it's how do you keep it going? I think uh, a lot, if, 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 if there's sort of persistence from, from communities on specific issues, that's where it sort of gets heard. I think, I think it's a lot to do with working with the counselor, honestly. So you're saying that the, the council is supposed to, that would be the kind of uh, uh, voice that the uh, officials will will hear, right? They won't hear that's, it from, from communities necessarily, right? They don't that's your best bet. I mean, the councilors, they direct staff and they direct projects. So I've, you know, just working in South Etobicoke, I remember there was a specific initiative that, um, you know, we got, we had a workload, uh, placed on us large that was largely count that was council driven um, so I think it's kind of it's it's really having them involved um, because it's tough yeah yeah how do you you know how do you build try you know I think I think what I've seen so far in 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 working in Lawrence Heights has been terrific in terms of just seeing uh, you know the the work done by that the lion group and um, and then the network of, of community organizations and the work of, um, of, of social development at, at City of Toronto, kind of their involvement in everything. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I've seen, I've seen a lot more in, in Lawrence Heights and I think, I think it's just, you know, main maintaining that strength and um, in terms of building trust, I think it's, it's it's i guess getting city staff and uh and, and other officials involved wherever possible i don't know yeah i mean there's a lot of different ways so uh well if you can share uh, with us like those different ways what i found specifically uh, challenging is um uh even if you have this uh yeah it's a, it's a great uh asset that you have this strong community um, sense and we have that many organizations uh, among the like residents groups and stuff uh, but it, it doesn't seem that it works effectively in terms of the like duration like sometimes the very uh, small movements will happen like in a very long period and I was thinking it might like the uh, revitalization itself it becomes a very lengthy process as well for probably uh, due to those obstacles like of the communication like very uh, complex and very uh, vague kind of uh, structure like that's how we see it from from our point of view so maybe it's not like this but that's what I'm thinking like how we can change our view of each other's press uh, it, it sounds very but what you just said about the counselor uh, when we talking to the counselor uh, uh, he would or she would say uh, something uh, similar that there are certain people who were responsible for that and it's it's become like a labyrinth, like walking through all yeah. these circles, and <laughs> it would never uh, get the result, like in a, in a kind of visible period. And that's what I was thinking. That might be the the most challenging part. Um, and those initiatives that we have so far, they uh, almost kind of like um, um, well, there's so many efforts and very very little result of it. And it's because of the system that very uh, look very. Um, uh, like huge and very uh, diverse, <laughs> not necessarily in a good sense, but uh, yeah, so what would be the way to navigate through that for the people who are not involved in the system? Uh, this is my major concern, like from, like from my experience. Uh, 
and maybe some other people will can join our conversation so it would be great to hear from Mohammed. maybe he has his experience how to um, build the trust and uh, with the, those different groups like uh, let's say TCHC representatives and the uh, residents or um, anybody else maybe Lisa or Olya if you have any comments to contribute to the conversation it would be great Hi, I'm, um, my name is Lisa. I'm from Radisson. Um, the question asks, what are the steps for building trust between city office and community groups? Now, um, like um, the guy just said, with the residence first, I was part of residence first. And all of the stuff we have done in the community is basically, it's all about funding is how do community groups get funding to do projects in, a, in, in the community? Because sometimes when you have to get funding, it is very difficult for groups to get funding to, to build, to do something in the community. And then the city will have a different idea from what community has. So this is how the city needs to sit down with community and kind of help them bring the idea to life. Because every, everybody have a different agenda coming to a community. And if it's with the city, it's, it's totally like residents will sit down, have a group, they will discuss, okay, they want to have a greenhouse, they want to have this and that, and then the city will say, Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. But then um, they will change it to something different. But as building the trust, you could go to your counselor, but that's a different thing. The counselor will say one, and then it's different. Because I know Elena did have some, they will, yeah, they, they do have conflicts. And Elena did have some of them too. But as we have to learn to build a trust where if a community group is doing something, how could we help them further it along to keep to to keep it going? And this is where the city so this is where the city supposed to come in and say, okay, this organization is doing something in, in Lawrence Heights or wherever. Let's let's help them with it. But there is nothing happening like that. So is how do we get organization to keep helping community groups make do the changes in the community that residents have vision and they would like to have.
sorry, I wasn't, uh, yeah, uh, my microphone didn't work. Uh, so I'm thinking of, uh, of the Mohammed suggestion as well, uh, that we have to know, uh, we need to know each other. And uh, what I imply in this, I don't know what Mohammed maybe uh, can comment uh, as well, what he uh, um, means by that. But for me, for example, uh, I wanted to, to know more about the system and how, what are those facets that include participation from the community. We're not aware of them uh, so far. And those uh, surveys, it seems they're not enough for, uh, for us to feel like fully included and fully uh, engaged. So um, yeah, I wonder what are those uh, facets that we can use uh, for this inclusion. Maybe Derek can comment on this, or maybe someone else has the experience uh, of uh, connecting with the system in a more uh, meaningful way. And to put on something more than we, we, we have in our case. Yeah, I think again, it's sort of just case by case. Um, and building trust, yeah, it, it's. Uh, I think it's also the length of time. A lot of a lot of it's just that just the time spent, you know, working on a project, working with different groups on a project, uh, the time spent engaging with the city, um, all of that sort of helps to build to build that trust and and um, and to build that foundation. And, And I guess one of the questions, I, I, in terms of the question, I think about, you know, what are, what are the issues of, of uh, trust? What are, you know, what, what are reason, what are the reasons to be um, mistrustful or, you know, yeah. So what's inhibiting the trust in the first place? What are the what are the barriers? So the way I see it from my standing point, like as a resident, uh, uh, for me it's a lack of information, like what uh, about agenda of the city uh, in terms of the community. And I wonder, I have a kind of a uh, question to uh, like for you as well. Like, what do you feel as a city uh, representatives? How you? feel about community? Do you have full trust in the community? Do you feel like you can trust the, uh, like, like those initiatives that residents have? Like, will you fully engage and fully support it? Like, it seems like you uh, very often reluctant to do that. That's that's how we see it from, from our standing point of view. And um, I wonder if you have this trust in the communities from like, if you represent as, not you personally, obviously, but uh, just, uh, as a, a representative of this of this group of city of the city group, uh, would you uh, acknowledge that there is the, from your side over the community is a full trust? Like you feel it's completely you you believe in us. You believe that this person or that person, or this group or this initiative uh, are very uh, uh, like uh, very like promising potential and capable of doing things. Because it seems like maybe it's about the control as well. Since you have the control and decision-making power, maybe you uh, can share it with us. This is might be the other option to uh, build this trust. So, Ellen, I was it more of a personal um, about my involvement, or was it kind of a general my thinking about how how TCH? I mean, I think we operate as I think we operate like personally. I, um, you know, I, I, I work for TCHC, um, and I am, um, 
you know, committed to, to community development initiatives. And that's a big part of, of, of why I chose to work for TCHC um, and supporting uh, supporting programs, initiatives, and everything, and things like that, and really listening and trying to understand what, how we can help with, with the resources that we have, um, how we can help move things forward. Um, and I think that I think that goes for, for my colleagues at least. That um, it's the same notion. Um, it, and oftentimes it's just you know what what are we cap what are we able to do at the moment or what sort of you know what sort of visioning can we do with the community and that's something that we're doing you know and i've seen a lot with a number of different um initiatives i mean and that's the wonderful thing about the revitalization is that there's there are a lot of these avenues uh for these discussions to happen um, whether it's a small scale you know amenity space change or uh, a new public park or an art center or, or whatever or programming so there's so many different avenues and um and i know that i know that tchc as a as an official i guess in this situation does devote a lot of resources to uh to engaging with the community and i know that we're constantly changing we're constantly evolving and learning and listening and um yeah Um, well, so that's, my, that's my kind of that's my my opinion and there's always room for improvement i mean that's the thing that's why we keep doing it that's doing this is why we keep evolving i think it's been getting better and better from what i've seen even in two years i haven't been i haven't been working on lauren sites for that long i've been working on other site other projects and i've seen lots of improvement lots of changes to how we um how we engage like how we track things how we monitor things and and not everybody's gonna going to agree, and that's the sort of other thing we have to look at when we're when we're when we're engaging is that you know it's often you know we have to be able to um, to create a level playing field for um, for these community discussions um, because a lot of the times it's it's uh, a few it's sometimes it sometimes becomes. Um, uh, not representative of everybody is we try we try our best to sort of you know, understand what what um, what the most what most people want and how it all how it all can interact and how it can and how we can think about what's the long term visioning for for uh, for TCH for these for these sites and communities. Thank you, Derek, for this uh, explanation. Because it, it's hard for us to know what's going uh, like on. If you feel like there is an improvement, because it's hard for us to see this improvement, we're just looking at from the different kind of um, side. And so it, it's good to know that there is something moving uh, in in your area, in your um, visions as well. Uh, and that's and that's Elena. That's one of the biggest challenges is to show is to go back to community because a lot is kind of it becomes a narrative and it, you know how do you go back to the community and say well you know we people change you know staff change all the time people move on to different roles people leave um, how do you keep the the story going how do you kind of keep the conversation going understand where um you know what has already been heard what what actions have been taken what adjustments have been made stuff like that so it's it's yeah it's a constant work in progress and and like reporting back to the community has always been um you know it's like ever it's ever ever evolving i think i think we're getting better at it um but there's certainly a lot of challenges and a lot of a lot of um you know, there's a lot of emotions in, in a lot of in a lot of these issues and, and projects we work on. So it's just kind of going back and talking about and what we did, what we've heard, and, uh, and how we're gonna how how we want to learn more and make different kinds of changes and or whatever it is. Right. So it seems like this data collection and analysis is taking so long that it makes these processes so so lengthy and uh, maybe less visible 
and the longer, uh, you know, like in the time period. Um, it may be, yeah. There's just there's just a lot of there's a lot of moving pieces at at, at you know a part of every project. It really it really depends on the specific example. And uh, I also um, have this this presumption that that might be the many. Uh, uh, a lot of reporting and a, a lot of consultations within the departments as well. So it also slows down the, pro the process of knowing each other but then trust, uh, like developing the projects together. And as I was wondering if it would be possible, uh, if there are possibilities in the system to uh, reduce those uh, steps for the project to be more uh, kind of uh, moving faster. Um, and how this data analysis and everything can be actually maybe maybe that can be part of the projects as well. So maybe if it's hard to do, uh, I mean, if it's uh, it's too much work and for the for the offices, maybe residents can do the same thing. Maybe the data can be uh, provided and open for the residents as well, and so they can. Uh, do this analysis as well. Okay, are we all back? Len, are you back? Yep, yes. Okay, so I was thinking we can maybe share, I don't know, some of the highlights from our discussion and then if we have time, we can go into the last thing. Good plan? <laughs> yes, yeah, that's a great plan. Okay. Uh, who's the first one? Maybe you folks can go first uh, while I reformat our thing. Um, so if you wanted to share some highlights, um, if anyone in your group wants to share some highlights, that's more than welcome. Well, I wonder if Yesti can share some highlights, because she was quite so far. Um, well, I guess, yeah, I was listening. Um, the highlights, I guess, for our discussion was that uh, to build trust, uh, we need to build the relationships and be more proactive. Uh, well, everyone needs to engage more between um yeah so i don't know if i'm going to do a good summary or not but i guess the the bottlenecks for the residents from what i understood is that they're not always aware of how to go about something how to how to ask uh for something from the from the officials um and who to speak with uh because i don't know if they're either redirected somewhere else or I'm, I wasn't quite sure about that, but, um, and then from, so from the officials' uh, explanations, and well, officials, somebody who works from, for TCHC, I, from what I understood is that there is a lot of progress uh, being done, but it's not always communicated to the community, so it's kind of hard to keep everyone uh, uh, in, how do you call it, up to date, I guess, with what's what's going on but there are meetings that can, can be attended um, and that's kind of a good starting point for the conversation uh, I don't know <laughs> Is, does anyone else want to uh, finish that up <laughs> Yeah, we uh, identified that there is a problem um, of communication between the groups, between the community and the uh, officials who administrate. And uh, um, yeah, it would be, it, it, we, we're going to like, yeah, it, there is a progress, but uh, we, we still have to work on that hard to make the process easy and more uh, fluent and more enjoyable for both groups, I guess. Yeah, maybe Lisa can add something. Hi, everyone. Yeah, because in our group, we said, um, like, 
when the community have a good doing project is that it's hard for them to get the funding to keep on doing the projects in the community and is basically the city have their own agenda instead of they support the community groups that are doing the work to kind of more show, okay, we have your back, here is the to keep on going with your program or with whatever project is happening in that community. So there need to be a more of an engagement, a discussion with the city to sit down with residents from the community to hear their ideas, use their ideas, and more involve them in whatever this whatever decision they are making instead of do making their own decision and then nobody and nothing. So that was my our discussion now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Yeah, it's a uh, it's uh, uh, most uh, more or less uh, what we were talking about. Yeah. Unless there is one to that or something for that. Yeah, no, I think that sums up. The, uh, and then I think the other idea is sort of thinking about what creates mistrust. You know, and how do how do you how do we acknowledge that? And how do you acknowledge that early? And and, and what are the steps to working on it? I mean, that's it's like the yeah the question almost it's it it invites more questions I, I find, but it, it, it's I think it's it's really really important to think about. So we'd like to pass the turn to the second group. Okay, yes, please, uh, you know, be easy on me with my formatting. Diana, I was lost without you. <laughs> uh, big shout out to Diana Lynn. She's been an amazing student with us, summer student with us at Northrop Community House, been working with us for the past uh, six weeks. This is her last week, but she's been behind the scenes doing all this great magic and yeah, just 20 minutes of me typing. I'm like, I don't know how you do, Diana. So <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> so I'm so sorry. It's, it's really small and big in different areas. And uh, I, I did my best under pressure. Um, so we have some of our notes here. I don't know if we want to read through it if, or if anyone from our group wants to kind of share. Uh, so we can do probably a, a bit of both. But if anyone wants to share what they, um, what they said or the highlights from this, the first question, uh, uh, please do. Okay, maybe, maybe I'll just read some of it. So the first question was, what are the steps to building trust between city officials and community groups? Uh, so some of the things we have up here is, you know, having opportunities to give feedback uh, and it needs to remain consistent. That came up multiple times in our, dis in our discussion is like, okay, it's not enough to just come uh, to consult with us um, at, at the very beginning. It's about coming back, you know, throughout the, the phases of, of the project uh, to communicate from the beginning into the end. Uh, that was very important for our group and it came up multiple times. Um, and what also came up was, um, not as much emphasis, yeah. Yeah, so it came up that there was not a lot of emphasis around resident engagement or involvement or, during the construction phase of the revite. So same thing around the con being consistent around communication. It's one thing to consult with residents in the very beginning, but like what about the middle? What about the end? Um, and that trust is really impacted by lack of communication and making people to feel used or exploited uh, and with no ways to communicate their desires or needs. Um, and we want to find new ways or finding ways to engage residents over a longer period of time for the rewrite. So that's kind of a recap of that slide. Maybe we just go through the slides and if anyone has anything else to add, they can. Um, so one of the steps, I think that was the same one. It's probably my fault, Diana. <laughs> so <laughs> what are the new channels we need to create for sharing uh, 
uh, decision-making power. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the ideas was that we can create a group with various stakeholders. So maybe a resident, maybe a TCH rep, maybe a, a city rep, and they can kind of form this body of, uh, of, of reps to, to help share that power. Um, utilizing social media, that was really good. It came up multiple times in our conversations in that, you know, even for number one, these, these ideas around creating these tables are often only shared with or with a few residents and not a lot of people hear about these opportunities. Um, so another way to kind of spread it out so more people can hear about it is social media. Um, and that came up twice. And the barriers um, is uh, the community is being over consulted, lots of surveys, lots of meetings. Uh, uh, and the feeling is that it's about checking boxes, checking off a to-do list uh, versus building relationships. Um, and the desire is to shift those intentions uh, and to see if, you know, is it really about collaboration or is it about checking off boxes? So even like redefining what is collaboration and what does it look like and how does it serve residents and how does it serve uh, city officials or any kind of body of power? Um, yeah, uh, what also um, kind of uh, presents a barrier is that, you know, maybe their community members are going to these consultations and they're not seeing their ideas being reflected or implemented into these um, designs or end projects, uh, which it, it breaks down communication and also breaks down uh, collaboration and trust. Uh, one of our students mentioned, um, yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll just stay on this one, Diana, and then we're going to skip to the end. Uh, uh, I think we need to demolish stigma against communities in order to achieve meaningful collaboration between city and community groups, uh, which is really great. An extension of that is, you know, thinking about how do city officials view uh, particular community members or, or groups or even communities in general, uh, racialized communities, under-resourced communities, etc., and what they're able to offer. Uh, and how does that view, uh, viewpoint or that stigma affect the way a uh, city or any kind of decision-making body uh, work with or collaborate with or lack thereof <laughs> with uh, residents. So that's pretty much a recap of what we wrote down together. But if there's anything else that I miss, uh, please share now before we uh, maybe segue to the end. Maybe Elena, you can sh um, share some final notes about this. Well, uh, I would like just to conclude to resume what you said. It's uh, both groups, I guess, uh, uh, came up with these similar uh, perspectives and uh, similar kind of ideas uh, uh, and directions how we can go further uh, in building these relationships, trustworthy relationships. And uh, um, we, we, we haven't really created the framework uh, guidelines for this new partnership uh, opportunities, but I, I feel that we are stepping on that territory. So it's a good uh, feeling that, that like I, I heard from this uh, experience that we, uh, we point out uh, some very important major problems and barriers that we now can address uh, in our future uh, relationships. In, and I, I, I um, invite everyone and encourage everyone to address those issues in a creative way. Uh, so it won't be uh, taken with resistance and reluctance. And uh, I'm just trying to make every side feel creative about this relationship and feel uh, uh, that there are possibilities to find enjoy, uh, enjoyable part of this relationship, not just the formal um, uh, reports and uh, data analysis. So it would be nice if we can move from this uh, formal uh, numbers and figures to the actually uh, characters and uh, personalities and uh, different talents, amazing, uh, of amazing people that live in the neighborhood. And uh, yeah, so probably just we need more informal connections, more, um, uh, as Mohammed said, more gatherings on a very kind of informal basis, probably. 
uh, where we can learn about each other uh, with more human uh, touch and more uh, like um, uh, how to say that uh, I'm not sure <laughs> if I have uh, words for that um, but yeah so m moving uh, uh, from this formal perception uh, of each other toward the human perception of each other maybe that would be the one of the uh, strategies that will lead to success and improvement well yeah, I think one of the next steps that Elena and I were talking about is we want to continue that these conversations and of course be mindful that uh, a lot of residents have had a lot of these conversations, um, but really continue with a purpose to support with the second phase of the revite. We want to make sure that residents get a chance to be more involved and we want to break down these barriers uh, of collaboration and, and build more trust. Uh, between the two or three bodies of power. So I uh, just want to end with that. This, this is just, just the beginning of many conversations and whatever, uh, but we actually hope that it manifests in us building a bridge uh, between residents and um, city and TCHEC. So now we can go on. So this kind of is the end of our conference. I'm just gonna say thank you and then I'm gonna let Athavan close the conference. Athavan is actually our student of our program. I wanna once again thank obviously everyone here uh, that's come out for the conference and has been here for the, probably the full duration of this round table. Thank you so much for being here. You are all stars. Uh, I wanna thank our resident co-facilitators who've been a part of our program. They came out weekly in our programs and mentored and supported our youth and were actually a part of the design process and they put in a lot of hours and time into it. So I really, uh, my heartfelt appreciation for all the residents who were involved, our partners, uh, who came out today, who've been major supporters of our program, our speakers, um, and also our funders, City of Toronto, Cultural Hotspot, Spark Project, United Way of Greater Toronto, our designer who created all these cool yellow kind of slides. Her name is Rosie. She is incredible. Follow her on Instagram and see some of her artwork. We really thank her for volunteering her, her time and her talents for the conference. I want to thank Diana Lynn again for being with us for the past six weeks. We really, imagine, we really do appreciate your expertise and your leadership. And yeah, Elena, thank you so much for being bold enough to uh, to start this program and to push it. And if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have been in this program. So I thank you so much. And yes, everyone else, I thank you so much for your time, your patience, um, and just your presence. And we're going to move into At The Van's closing. Hello. Thank you for joining us today. And I hope that you enjoyed yourself. My name is At The Van and I'm a student of the 2020 Youth Architects Program. I would like to share with you how this program has impacted me. The Youth Architect Program has opened my eyes to the world of architecture and I'll definitely, definitely be applying what I learned from this program to the future. Thank you and we hope to see you. Wait. Thank you, Adhavan. Thank you everyone for joining us. We'll be sending emails out to you hopefully in the next couple of weeks with the presentations and more information about our next steps. But in the meanwhile, have an amazing rest of your day. We'll be in touch and we hope to work with you very soon on the next phase of our projects.